singing right there. And our subject tonight is going to be who are the bosses? I'm going to ask you three questions. I'm going to try to answer those three questions. Hope you can remember those three questions. The questions are who are the bosses? The second question is how did they get to become bosses? And the third question is what does it have to do with me? Or what does it have to do with you? Okay? Do you remember those three? All right, that's what we're going to be talking about in just a minute, and hopefully I will close with a challenge to you. I do thank you for being here tonight. I thank you for the opportunity to speak to each and every one of you. If you will, please allow me just a moment to tell you just a little bit about myself. My name is Roy Deaver, and as Victor has already mentioned, I am a Christian. I'm a minister. He didn't tell you I'm a husband, and I'm a father, and I'm a grandfather. And besides all of those things, I think the main reason why I was asked to come tonight is because I also do serve as an elder in the Lord's Church. I count it an honor and a privilege to be able to serve in that capacity. My father before me was an elder in the Lord's Church. My grandfather before him was an elder in the Lord's Church. In addition to serving as an elder and as a minister, now this is going to catch you, off guard. I'm also a school teacher. I teach the 7th and 8th grade students, College Middle School, Lake Worth ISD, Northwest area of Fort Worth, Lake Worth area. So I'm around teenagers, I guess you could say just about all day, every day. And I enjoy that very, very much. But teenagers are always struggling with a particular issue, and that issue is who's boss. <laughs> Got to get it figured out. Got to get it figured out. Who's in authority? But when you talk about who's the boss, that's who does have the authority. Who makes the rules? Who decides what needs to be done? So I see this struggle in school every day. And I see those teenagers who have learned early to respect authority at home as a young child. They're the ones that usually are the most successful in school because they learn to comply with the rules. They learn to pay attention and show respect for the rules and for those in authority, including their teachers and principals, etc., etc., etc. And in contrast, I saw at school, I see at school from time to time those who do not really accept authority readily. And uh, I guess this is just, there's, there's not that many of them, but there are some. And just a few days ago, I saw a young man in in-school suspension. And we have some out-of-school suspension, and we have some in-school suspension. But this kid was in in-school suspension. And I talked to the man who was in charge of that in-school suspension, and uh, he told me, well, I told this young man, I said, son, you got to learn to obey the rules. Now, I'm not going to use the words that this kid used back. They're pretty filthy. <laughs> But he said, I make my own blank, blank, blank rules. And I'm thinking, yeah, how's that working out for you, son? Yeah. How's that working out for you? So, you know, if you, if you say, I'm not going to follow anybody's rules, how are you going to hold down a job? Because there's going to be a boss somewhere telling you what to do. How are you going to get a paycheck? Because they're paying you to do something. If you can't follow the rules, they're going to, maybe you're going to be operating equipment. Maybe you're going to be operating accounting, but there's principles. And whatever job you have, if you, you've got to respect the rules and the procedures and those who are in charge. Okay, so as we come to the church in just a few moments, we're going to ask who are the bosses in the church. Now, our first question was, remember, can you tell who is the boss? Second question, how did they get to become bosses? And third question, what does it have to do with us? Okay, that's where we're going to go. Now I'm going to ask you to think with me about a scripture. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Now it starts off with the word children. And my youngest daughter, when she was growing up, she used to say, that's my daddy's favorite verse. Children, obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. And then he goes on to say, honor your father and mother. That's respect for their authority, for their position. They brought you into this world. Listen to them. Why? So that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. What? 
Believe me, if I pay attention to my mother and my father and I respect them and their authority, then I'm going to live a long life. Quite possibly, quite possibly. But I can promise you, if you don't respect the authority of your mother and father, if you don't respect the rules and the regulations which they make and they tell you for your own good, then you won't live a long life. Here's another illustration. My oldest daughter, when she was about, oh, maybe three, four years old, I used to live in Kennerdale, Texas, preached down there for a while, South Fort Worth. And the little street that we lived on had a racetrack just down the road from us. And there was a lot of traffic down there on Friday nights, especially. My, young, my oldest daughter, when she was really, really young, she loved to play in the street. Can you imagine that? Well, why would a kid love to play in the street? because there were no grass burgers out there. <laughs> Everywhere else in the yard was grass burgers, and she wanted to get out there in the street. Now, I couldn't explain to this three-year-old, you know, well, let me tell you about cars, honey. Let me tell you about horsepower. Let me tell you about debt. I can't do that. But I could give her a spanking on the leg or the bottom or something else, and she begins to associate pain with being out there. And it gets her attention. Now, that wasn't because I was mad at her or angry with her. I'm trying to keep the girl alive. So as parents, we make rules, regulations, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but how many of you have ever done something and your mama told you or your daddy told you, look, I'm going to tell you to do this and it's for your own good. <laughs> you ever hear that? It's for your own good. Now, sometimes you don't believe them, but they're trying to look out for your best interest. All right. So, we want to try to, to live long life. Now, our subject tonight, who's the boss or who are the bosses? This question comes to us in the context of the New Testament church. In the church, who is the boss or who are the bosses, okay? Now, that leads us to the concept, who is in charge? Who is in authority? Who makes the rules? Who makes the decisions? Now, I know during the Summer of the Series, the theme this year has been the Ecclesia. I see it on several shirts around here. The Ecclesia means the called out, but that's the way it's translated church. So we're called out of the world. We live in the world, but we're not like the world. We're called out. We're special. We're different. And we have some different rules. We have some different expectations. So you already know that that means the called out. Christians are called out of the world by the gospel. And when we obey the gospel in baptism, the Lord adds us to the church. So I appreciate Victor's comments while ago. It's not the building. Who is the church? You can all raise your hand on that one. We are the church. The church is the people. So again, in the church, who are the bosses? Who has the authority? Who makes the rules? Who makes the decisions? Okay? So I have a question for you. Listen carefully and think about it. Whose church is it anyway? Whose church is it anyway? The answer is his Christ. I agree. He's the one who said, I will build my church, Matthew 16, 18. Ephesians 5, 23 tells us he is the head of the church. He's the head, we're the body. We are guided to listen to his instructions. We're moved by his will. Christ loved the church so much that He gave Himself for it. He died for it. And in Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, we read that Christ is the head of the church, and in all things, I'm going to use a big word right here, but I want to explain it. He might have the preeminence. Now, some of you who are in high school know what that means. Some of the young ones, He is the supreme one. He is the top of the ladder. He is the one who is the highest, ultimate, authority in the church. So it's Christ's church and He is the highest authority. Okay, so now the church is worldwide. It's nearly 2,000 years old and Christ is the highest authority in the church. So how does it operate in a practical sense? How does it operate on a day daily basis? Alright. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 12, tells us a little bit about how it's organized. 
In the church, there were first apostles, there were prophets, I mean, people who spoke for God. There were evangelists, people who went around spreading the gospel. There were pastors, sometimes translated elders, that's what we're going to talk about. There were also teachers. But there was one purpose for all of these, and that is to help the church grow and build itself up and get to be mature enough that it could do the work of ministry and build itself up. So these functions are to help the church grow, to help build up the body of Jesus Christ. Now all of you know about the Apostle Paul and his work. On his missionary journey, his first missionary journey, he established a lot of churches in what is now modern day Turkey. And what you may not know is Istanbul, I don't know if you heard about the terrorist attack there today, that used to be a very, very strong Christian center. In those days, it was called Constantinople, city of Constantine. But things have changed in that part of the world now. We're living in a different world than existed back then, but we have some things to do with it. But when Paul went back through that territory, modern Turkey was called Asia Minor then, yeah. ordained elders in every city. Now, I use the word elders tonight. He ordained elders in every city. There are other words in Scripture to talk about these men. Elders is a term used to describe their age, their experience, their wisdom, and their judgment. Sometimes they are called shepherds or pastors. Like a shepherd takes care of his sheep, elders take care of the New Testament church, each local congregation. Sometimes they're referred to as overseers, and occasionally the word bishop is used. This talks about their function. They supervise, they oversee the work of the church in local congregations. Now, before we run out of time, I want to mention to you the answer to the second question. How did elders get to become bosses? Well, we mentioned Paul went around appointing them. The Holy Spirit appointed elders, had them appoint elders in every city. All right. There are qualifications, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and also in Titus chapter 1. Take the time to look at those qualifications. These men who serve as elders have been placed in charge of local congregations based upon the fact that, quote, they qualify for the job. They have proven to be faithful Christians. I'm paraphrasing those qualifications. They have proven to be faithful Christians. They have proven to be good leaders men of sound judgment, men of very high moral character, and faithful Christians able to lead and guide by what they say and also by their example. So how did they get to become bosses, quote unquote? Well, Christ's will was that there be elders in every congregation to guide and to lead each congregation locally. It was Christ's will, according to the scriptures, that all appoint these elders, and this continued to be the practice based upon their qualification. So if I ask you how does somebody get to be an elder, they meet the qualification. How does anybody else get another job? They qualify for the job. So there are some expectations of men who serve as elders. Now, we get a little bit of insight into their duties. I'm going to go on now, okay? A little bit of insight into their duties in Acts chapter 20, verse 28. The Apostle Paul told these elders, he said, You take heed or pay attention to yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made the overseers to feed the church of God, literally shepherd the flock, shepherd the sheep, which he has purchased with his own blood. So the church belongs to Christ. It doesn't belong to the elders. But elders have been appointed now as Christ's representatives to guide and to lead by what they say and by their example by sound doctrine, to teach, to exhort, to convict those who oppose, to feed the flock, to oversee the flock, to lead by example, and in short, to take care of you. That's why they are there. That's why they are there. Okay, so what does it have to do with me? What does it have to do with me? Well, as a Christian, as a Christian, what does it have to do with me? Well, if God put them there to take care of me, kind of like he gave me parents in my home to tell me what to do and to guide me and to help me mature and to grow up. In the New Testament church, Christ has placed elders in the church, now again, by meeting the qualifications and being appointed to that.
that position by the members of that congregation. They are in charge of your spiritual well-being. They help to provide you with opportunities to grow, to be taught. They're responsible for the teachers that are selected, the quality of the teaching. They're responsible for having an opportunity for you to come in and to worship and to be a part of that congregation for the activities. So they are there for you. And Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7 gives us the other side of that. It says to Christians, obey them that have the rule over you because they watch on behalf of your soul. So why are they there? Like a daddy watching his three-year-old trying to keep her out of the street so she can grow up and live a long and healthy life, the elders are in your congregation to help you to grow, to mature, to develop into spiritual leaders. More about that in just a second. They help you become what you need to become and to grow spiritually and ultimately for your salvation. They are the spiritual leaders of the congregation. So what do you do? You obey them that have a rule over you. Why? Because they watch on behalf of your soul. 1 Timothy 4.17 says, Let elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. Now maybe before tonight you didn't understand what the elders did. Maybe before tonight you didn't really see the importance of that. But we are responsible to God for submitting to their decisions. And they are responsible to God for your actions. And that may be a scary thing. They are trying to help you, to guide you. They try to carry out the work of the New Testament church. They don't make rules that Christ didn't make, but they use their wisdom, they use their judgment to help carry on that work there. So Christ is the boss. So within local congregations, elders have the highest authority, and they are indeed accountable to Christ. They are also accountable to their congregation because they are Christ's delegated representatives. So Christ is the boss, elders are his representatives, and the highest authority in the New Testament congregation. I wish I had time to give you some very powerful examples of what happens when people listen to and follow the instruction of elders. I want to close with a challenge to you. Look around you for just a second. See who's sitting by you. Look around you, and I might even say you turn around and look at who's behind you. Sometimes you don't know who's behind you watching you, okay? There is a challenge for you. Now, not only do you look around, but I want to ask you to look into the future. This is something that's very difficult for young people to do. Can you look into the future? I want you to try. Sometimes I have my kids write articles, write stories, and do PowerPoints about their life up to this point, and then also add, what do you plan to be five years from now? Five years is a big jump. What about 25 years? The Lord established the church 2,000 years ago, and he said, get this part of it, he said, even Hades itself will not be able to destroy you. The church will continue, okay? The church will continue. Again, what does it have to do with me? I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what it has to do with me. Not only do you respect the elders, not only do you listen to them, try to work with them, follow their lead, follow their guidance, make friends with them. Let them become role models for you. Let them inspire you. Let them teach you. Let, you, let them encourage you. Why? Because in 20, 25 years, some of you will become elders and deacons. We'll hear more about the deacons in just a minute and the Lord's church. I often wonder who's going to replace me. The answer is you will. <laughs> How do you like that? Huh? <laughs> who's going to replace you, Deaver? The answer is you will. You will. Now, you don't just wake up some morning at age 40 or 50 and say, hey, I'm qualified to be an elder. <coughs> when does it start? Right here, right now. You got that right. Right here, right now. What about these qualifications? I have to keep my life clean. I have to grow spiritually. I have to develop my, my capabilities of teaching and leading and guiding and being a good example. Well, Christ said everybody, let your light shine before me that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. It starts right here, right now with you. 
Don't pay attention to what the world is saying. Pay attention to Christ's rules. Why? They'll keep you out of the street. They'll keep you safe. Listen to Him. Pay attention. And I want to challenge you. Here's the deal. In 15 or 20, 25 years, you be coming ready to step into that slot as a deacon for 15, 20, 25, 30, 40 years as an elder. The church will continue. But I promise you, it is always going to need, here's the word, good bosses or good leaders. It's always going to need good leaders. Now, some of you may be leaders in your class at school. That's a good step. Some of you may be leaders in your academic prowess or something along that line. Some of you may be leaders in your community already by volunteering for different things. The church will always need good leaders. And here's the challenge for you. We've answered the question, who are the bosses? The answer is the elders in the Lord's church. How did they get to become bosses? By qualifying for the job and following Christ's instructions. And what does it have to do with me? Right now, I listen to them, I follow their lead, I follow their guidance, I submit to their will, I work with them for the good of the entire body. And what's my challenge? To try to be a faithful Christian and become qualified in the future as a leader in the Lord's church. That's the challenge that I want to leave with you. One of my favorite pictures is a picture of a tall, lanky man, kind of scruffy looking. He's got an axe. He's got some rails over here that he's cut. He's got some wood over here that he's splitting to make rails. And it is a picture of a young man, a young Abraham Lincoln, who never won any kind of election at all until he became president of the United States. But he has a book in one hand, an axe in the other, He's studying, he's thinking, he's listening, he's talking to himself basically about what all these things mean. And underneath that picture are the words, prepare yourself and the opportunity will come. I want you to think about that. Study God's word, pay attention to him, grow, listen, learn, develop, prepare yourself to be leaders in the Lord's church. Thank you for your attention. I want to try this mic here. Can y'all hear me in the back? No. Okay. I appreciate that way we don't have to change the mic around. Uh, I appreciate the words of uh, Brother Roy tonight and a uh, very learned man. And I, I really appreciate listening to older men as they as they speak to us and give us wisdom and what they know. And it's important, as he said, that we strive to gain knowledge each and every day we can be better Christians. I am a... How many people have contacts? Who wears contacts in here? Okay, if you know anything about contacts, what happens at the end of the day? It feels like you got stuff in your eyes, don't you? Okay. That's where I'm at right now. So if I, if I act like I can't read, you'll know why I can't read. I've got stuff in my contacts. It's bothering me right now. But I am a deacon for the Sigaville Church of Christ. And I appreciate uh, being asked to come and speak to you briefly about what the role of deacons are. Deacons, it is a great privilege to be a deacon. And I really appreciate the, the local congregation feeling that I was up to that task. I really appreciate them uh, putting their trust in me to be a deacon. And deacon, to be a deacon is a great privilege. And the office of a deacon began very early on in the church, and it began in Acts chapter 6. If you look at Acts chapter 6, and starting in verse 1, it is the beginning of a, a particular issue comes up, and uh, there's some needs that need to be taken care of in the local congregation. And this local congregation was facing some issues, and as Brother Roy mentioned, one of the main tasks of an eldership is to lead the congregation spiritually. And when this issue came up in the church, I'll let you read that since my, my eyes are going bad on me. I'll let y'all read that on your own time. But what happened is the elders looked among themselves and decided, we need to spend more time in the business of souls. And what that does is, is that they were trying to do some jobs that weren't necessarily best fitted for them as as the shepherds of the congregation. 
So they looked out amongst themselves and they looked and said, find seven men of good report, some good fellows in your congregation, and put them in charge of the work that needed to be done. And these deacons were assigned that particular work of being the Grecian widows. And again, you can read that on your own time. But they were appointed to serve, and what that did, that allowed the eldership, the, the shepherds, the overseers of this congregation to spend more time about the, the business of souls. And the souls of the congregation are the most important thing. Now, I think a deacon is a great, again, a great honor and a privilege, but we look to the elders for our appointments. In other words, they assign us certain things, and, and Victor asked me to kind of say a few things of what, what the, our deacons are in charge of. Our eldership is asked the deacons of our congregation, and each individual congregation uh, has elders that assign their deacons different tasks. My particular task is the youth. So I work with the kids, and we come to events like this, and some of the things that I'm assigned to do. But I'm also given other tasks to take care of. Uh, some of our deacons are given the task of maybe taking care of the building. You know, we come into a building like this, we, we think, well, the fans are running, the air conditioning is running, uh, the parking lot's, you know, halfway straight, things are taken care of around the building. We don't realize who takes care of that. A lot of times that's deacons. Uh, deacons are in charge of a lot of those tasks that you just don't realize who takes care of that. And I really appreciate the other deacons who take the time to, you know, when you go to the, when you go in the restroom, don't you hope that restroom, don't you hope the toilet flushes? A lot of times the deacons take care of that, make sure that's fixed, and that's going, the air conditioners are running, things like that. But they give us tasks, and that allows, that frees them up to maintain the overseer's task that is given to them. And it's a very important task for them. Now, I've been given the, the uh, task of dealing with the youth and, and taking care of certain things, but a deacon should always be open to anyone in the congregation. I think it's important that a deacon not just zero in on what they're given by the eldership, but also be open to the task that any member might need. If a member comes up to me and asks, can you help me in this, in this area? I think it's important for a deacon to step up and be able to do that in a cheerful way and not just say, hey, I'm only in charge of this. Do you have to call somebody else out there? So it's important for a deacon to be open to other things, uh, be willing and ready to serve. That's what the idea of a deacon is, is a servant. And a servant is not just a servant of one thing, he can be a servant of many things. And you as individuals can be servants in your own way uh, in each of your individual tasks of life. Um, some of the things I, I, I mentioned a few, but some of the things that our deacons are given are building maintenance. Uh, grounds, activities that were put together. Like say you have a special activity and you want to, there's a lot of people, a lot of things that go on behind the scenes that allow that activity to take place. Uh, we have a deacon in charge of curriculum. In other words, uh, he might be in charge of putting together lesson plans or giving the teachers an overall uh, umbrella to get under as far as what they're going to teach and what they're going to uh, take care of in their classes. And Brother Roy mentioned something uh, that is important for you. You as individual men and young men need to aspire to be leaders in the church. You need to aspire to be deacons. And one thing I'd like to say, uh, a deacon is not just a junior elder. I've heard that said a few times that, oh, well, that's just a, a junior elder or something. That's not the case. A deacon has their own set of uh, responsibilities, elders, are the leaders of the church, and the deacons are there to serve them and to serve the congregation. That's a real short synopsis on deacons, and as was mentioned, their, their qualifications are in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8 and 13. And uh, if I try to read that right now, I will go through that. So you guys read that on your own. Right there along with the elders' qualifications is something to aspire to. It's a roadmap for you young men that you can aspire to be that kind of man that God wants you to be. Aspire to be great. You know, years ago when uh, there was a commercial that the Air Force ran, and you remember, you guys might be a little, what was the, what was the theme of that Air Force commercial? That's the army looking for a few good men. <laughs> what was it? Aim high. 
Air Force, aim high. And I think that's something you could live by. Aim high, aim for a, aim for a job in the church, a responsibility in the church that you can aspire to. If you start off right now aspiring to that goal, you can reach that goal. It takes some effort. You just, uh, again, as Brother Roy said, you won't just fall into it one day. Well, look, I just had to be qualified. So make that effort to be qualified to be elders and deacons in your local congregation. In in a group this large, I don't, of course, I don't know all of you. Uh, there are many people at many stages in life, and I'm sure there's some here that, through your study of the Word, study the Bible, study with your youth minister, with your preacher, you come to a realization that you need to be a Christian. And it's a fairly simple process to become a Christian, but it's a lifelong commitment. And if you feel a need to be a Christian, it's a, it's a fairly simple idea, actually. It demands that you believe. You believe in Christ. You confess Him as your Savior. You confess Him as that He is who He said He was when He came to this earth. And that you would repent of your sins, which is a turning away, which is easier said than done. That's a difficult task to repent of your sins. A confession, a repentance, and a burial in baptism. And we hate to, to close a meeting like this without giving that invitation. If there's any reason why you would need to come forward at this time, we ask you please come forward while we stand and sing. Oh.